So John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, he says, grace to you and peace. Grace and peace. Peace always follows grace, by the way. You don't have peace without grace. You want peace, you need grace. Grace first and peace. From him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. So right off the bat, John does something really cool. He references the Trinity. All three persons of the Trinity are mentioned right here. You see him who is and who was and who is to come. Speaking of God the Father. You see down in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, speaking obviously of the Son, you also see from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And you might stop and go, okay, right there, that just freaks me out. I have enough trouble dealing with the Trinity, with three of them, and now you're telling me there's seven. <laughs> Old Testament. Old Testament study unlocks the revelation. What are you talking about? Flipping your Bibles back to chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11. You Bible students know exactly what this says. All of you will know exactly what this says in just a moment. Actually, hopefully all of you are Bible students. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Who are the seven spirits who are before his throne? Let's make sure we understand this, get it out of the way right now. Beginning in verse 1, Isaiah chapter 11. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Okay, this is talking about Jesus. Jesse, the father of David. Jesus in the line of David. Jesus is the branch. I love this. That word branch is netzer, which is where the word Nazarene comes from. Netzer, Nazarene. A branch will come from the stem of Jesse and bear fruit. Verse 2. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is describing here, gang, the perfect, the complete, sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. As you read through this. And again, an Old Testament student, a, a Jewish person reading, seeing John write of grace to you and peace from him who was and him who is and him who is to come and, and Jesus Christ and the seven spirits. A Jew in the day might have gone, seven spirits. Spirits. Oh, wait a minute. Isaiah 11. Chapter 2, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and strength and knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And you might say, excuse me, Pastor Rick, I only count six. So how is it the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's count them together. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Oops. Well, so much for that example. No, listen to this. Listen to this, because it's a direct comparison to something that was in the temple. Something that was in the tabernacle. But again, a Jewish person would understand this use of seven, though there are six ministries listen, uh, listed. Listen to this, Exodus chapter 25, verse 31. In Exodus 25, 31, and keep your finger in Isaiah 11. God's telling Moses how to construct the tabernacle. We just ran through this a, a few months back. And he says, you shall make a lampstand, a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. Six branches shall go out from its side. Three branches of the lampstand from one side, three branches of the lampstand from the other side, which means there were six branches coming off of one central shaft. Six branches. But how many lamps were there? Exodus 25, verse 37 says, Then you shall make its lamps seven in number. And they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it. The lampstand in the tabernacle had a sh central shaft. On it was a lamp. And then there were six shafts coming off of it, either off of either side. It was a menorah. And each of those six had a lamp, so you had seven total lamps. You had the shaft, and then you had the branches coming off of it. Does that make sense to everyone? You picture that? So six branches, one shaft, seven bulbs. Now look at Isaiah chapter 11 again. The Spirit of the Lord is the central shaft. 
the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord branching off of the central shaft, which is the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, yeah, but how is that a ministry? Listen, and this is very cool. In fact, this just came to me today, this afternoon. I was freaking out trying to get everything finished. This is how ministry works. This is how ministry works. I might be a Bible teacher. There's a branch. I might at times be a worship leader. There's a branch. I, I also am just Rick. That's the shaft. Rick gets the shaft. I, I know that, how that just came out there. But gang, listen. Titles in churches tend to suck the relationship out of ministry. Well, I'm the pastor of prayer. Therefore, I'm here praying because that's my job. Or are you there praying because of the relationship? Now, I poked a lot of fun at Aaron tonight about the whole male cheerleader thing which I just wanted to say one more time. I'll tell you why, though. I'll tell you why I'm able to do that. I love Aaron. I've been getting to know Aaron and his wife, Kelly. They are the coolest couple. Aaron is the only person who every single Sunday morning, as we're just about to start worship, shouts out, Hi, Rick! But we have a relationship. And Aaron, I hope by now, <laughs> knows me well enough to know that even when I'm joking around, that I love you. We have a relationship. That's ministry. Now, I haven't done anything particularly other than, you know, just rip them apart tonight. I'm just, but I have a relationship. If I see Aaron in town somewhere, I might not bow and pray for him. I might not open the scriptures and teach him right there on the street. But I'll talk to him. I will engage in conversation. And we'll probably talk about the Lord relationship. That's just two guys being who they are. That's ministry. That's ministry at its best. Relationship is always better than ministry. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's got these ministries. He's got wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, fear, all these things that he can give us and place into our lives. But the most precious ministry of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit himself. As we seek to have the gifts of the Spirit given, to experience the Spirit moving and working in our lives and doing things through us and, and with us, don't get so focused on the gifts that you forget about the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus who wants to take up residence in your heart, in your life. That's the greatest ministry. If none of the gifts were given, but the Spirit resided in us, we would have the best of all possible ministries. John 14, verse 16. Jesus said, I'm going to ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper that He may be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus says, I will come to you. Oh, you mean at the second coming? Jesus will come. No, I will come to you because I'm going to send you my spirit. My spirit will come to you. In John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and I love this, make our abode with him. So of all these ministries that the Holy Spirit offers, these sevenfold ministries, the best is that central shaft. It is the Holy Spirit himself. Now, John goes on to describe, back in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus character, characteristics of Jesus. This is not the, the uh, physical description that he's going to give later in the chapter. These are just the characteristics. And he says that Jesus is, in verse 5, the faithful witness. The faithful witness. Beautiful testimony to the one who is the testimony himself. John 1.18 tells us, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, has explained him. Jesus, the faithful witness. John 14, verse 8, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said, how long have I been with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus comes down as the physical representation, manifestation of God. So if you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. If you want to know how God would react in a particular situation, look at how Jesus reacted. If you want to know what's important to the Father, listen to the Son. Because Jesus is the faithful witness, and He's also the faithful witness to your life today. Matthew 28, verse 20, I will be with you always. 
I will be that witness that is with you. In Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, I will never desert you or forsake you. I'll never do that to you. I love where Jesus said earlier that my peace I give to you, I don't give like the world gives. And so when he makes a promise as we began tonight, we know he's going to follow through. Jesus is the faithful witness. He's also the firstborn, the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn of the dead. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And then he says this stunning statement. It's the hinge of Christianity. He says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Can you listen to me on this? Practical Christianity with no focus on where we're headed and being with the Lord is a waste of your time. Unless it is in conjunction with being with the Lord. I'll say that again. Practical Christianity without a focus on the eternal, without a focus on going to be with God, is a waste of your time. There are all kinds of great self-help books on morality and values. Man, if you want to be a book of virtues kind of person, that's terrific. But that alone won't save you. That alone is not going to change you. That alone won't engulf your life with the Holy Spirit. Only the focus on Jesus, on being with Jesus, who is the firstborn of the dead. If we've hoped in Jesus just for this life, we are of all men most to be pitied. But, but Paul said, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. He's the firstborn of the dead. Well, does that mean that he was the first to be raised from the dead? No. We already know that. Others were raised from the dead before Jesus. Jesus himself raised people from the dead, but they all died a second time. Jesus is the first to be raised from the dead, never to die again. But here's good news. He wasn't just the first raised as in the only one. He was the first as in many are going to follow. Many are going to be raised, never to die again. You're looking at one of them right here. And look around, because we're in a room full of people who, even if we die, will be raised never to die again. Jesus is just the firstborn from among the dead. We're the rest of the born from among the dead. That's exciting stuff. As we talked about this morning, Jesus is, he is the predecessor of our future. If you want to know where you're headed, if you want to know what your body's going to be like, what it's going to be like after you're, you're glorified and resurrected, look at Jesus. Because Jesus went first, the firstborn of the dead. I got a phone call last week from Hunter. And uh, he and Becky went home after the, the Revelation study. And there were questions about death. A lot of them that, that we answered this morning. And that was part of the, the motivation to talk about some of those things today. But it, it was a great conversation. And it, it just hit me as we were talking. Hunter, you want to know what happens after you die? Look at Jesus. Because he's the firstborn from among the dead. He's the one. He resurrected. He ascended. He was glorified. He got to walk through walls. Cool. He was able to do that. And Jesus was able to be wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Awesome. Does that mean maybe I'll get to be that way? I think so. Because you and I are going to have glorified bodies just like Jesus' body was glorified. And I think that'll be so fun in the millennium just to pop into a room somewhere and freak people out. <laughs> you stop doing that. He's the firstborn from among the dead. John also said he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Hmm. Now, a Jewish person, a Jewish Christian, reading this might have a little trouble with this. Jesus, the ruler of the kings of the earth. There was a king. A king who was only three years old when his father died, and his mother remarried but wasn't happy with hubby number two, so she sent her son to bring his stepfather a bowl of vegetables laced with poisonous mushrooms, and before the age of ten, this boy watched his second dad die at the dinner table. At age twelve, he became angry with a buddy that he often played with, and so he tortured him to death. At age fifteen, he married his first wife, but he became displeased with her, and he strangled her with his own hands. He killed wife number two as she lay next to him in bed. Wife number three fared no better. He killed her as well. By now, his mother was getting upset with all these killings and the deranged uh, motives of her, of her son and all his son's wives dying. 
And he got tired of hearing her talk about it, so he murdered her too. He killed his mother, his first three wives, his childhood friend, his stepfather, all before what we would consider adulthood. He was a certifiable sociopath. But this insane man somehow came to a position of great power, ultimately demanding, demanding to be worshipped as God. He decreed that all people in his vast realm would refer to him as Nero, Caesar, and Lord. Worship me as God. But there was a people who already had a Lord in that day. Christians who would only bow the knee to their Lord Jesus and not to this Nero. And when they refused to worship Nero as Caesar and Lord, he went on a sick campaign. Accompanied by soldiers of Rome gathering up Christians, he dipped them alive in hot wax. And then he would take these dipped Christians, still alive, but completely encased in wax, and he would hang them on poles all about his palace gardens. In the evenings, he would light them on fire, get into his chariot completely naked, and ride wildly through his gardens while these Christians were burning alive, shouting, You are the light of the world! You are the light of the world! And John says, Jesus is the ruler of of the kings of the earth. And every Christian who read those words would say, Nero? Nero? He was followed by another one who was just as bad, Domitian. Several of these Roman kings who were so brutal to the Christians. You know, by the way, at the time of age of 31, Nero slit his own throat. And by that time, some estimate that he had murdered, slaughtered as, million, as many as three million Christians in Nero's reign. Paul wrote to this same church in Rome, he wrote, For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. And a Christian in John's day might ask, well, what do we do? How do we handle it? If I mean, if Nero is elected... What do we do with this official? What do we do with this president that we disagree with? How do we handle these world rulers? And especially knowing that Jesus, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth? Here's the answer. It's not your problem. It's not your deal. It's not your issue. You worship the Lord. Yeah, but, but what if they kill us? which a Christian in that day would very easily be able to say, and by the way, Christians around the world today who are martyred for their faith could say, How, what do we do with a ruler of our country who might kill us? And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, you fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You keep your allegiance to the Lord. And let him deal with those rulers because he is in charge of them and he will deal with them. Going on in this verse, he is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And John says to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That word released is luo. It means bathed. In other words, Jesus bathed us in his own blood bathed us, washed us clean. I love this verse. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this line is just perfect. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were bathed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And as we spoke about this this morning, man, if you've come to Christ, if you're in Jesus, you've been bathed. You are clean. Don't look back. Look forward. Stop wallowing in the sin of the past and look forward to the joy of the future and the wonder of God in your life in the present. Jesus bathed us in his own blood. We are clean. Verse 6. And, and if that wasn't enough... He has made us to be a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus made us to be a kingdom of priests. 
Now we'll look into this more as we go, but Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Wait a minute. So you're saying that we get to reign. Yeah. You will reign as priests with Christ. When? Where? On earth. On earth. But when does that happen? I thought we were caught up to be with him in the air. I thought we went to be with the Lord in heaven. I thought that's where we were going. That's right. It is. This happens after that. You're coming back. You're coming back. Now I'm going to tell you something. First time I heard that, I thought the person who said it was nuts. I'm coming back? If you go to heaven, I'm going to come back? Yeah, but not as, you know, your own sinful self again. You come back as the glorified priest ruling and reigning with Jesus. It's incredible. It's not a fairy tale. Gang, this is biblical truth. Look at verse 7. It tells us, Behold, behold, he is coming with the clouds. The clouds. All right, flip in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Hang with me just a little longer tonight. Matthew 24. You can do the whole chapter, Rick? No. We're almost there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. How many of you who have studied either Revelation or other things with me have heard me say we're almost there and a half hour later? <laughs> Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. <laughs> That's what you call a captive audience. Verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not get its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see, when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. This is not the rapture of the church. Be clear about this. This is a different event. This is part of the second coming. But the second coming happens in two installments, gang. The church is raptured. It's pulled out. And there's a seven-year period of tribulation on the earth. And then, and then Jesus returns. And then Jesus has his glorious appearing. Paul tells us in Titus 2.13 that we are to be looking for the blessed hope. That would be the rapture. And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Jesus is coming. But look back in Revelation. Quickly flip back there. Jesus is coming. Verse 7 tells us. He is coming with the clouds. Not on the clouds. Not in the midst of the clouds. Not in the clouds. He is coming with the clouds. Now these clouds are not nimbus or cirrus or cumulus. They're rickus. Or spencerous. Do you get what I'm saying? They're kellyus. Or sandrus. That's the kind of clouds we're talking about. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, speaking of right now, since we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's throw off the thing that entangles. The clouds, the clouds are people of faith. Great clouds as Jesus returns, coming with the clouds, clouds of people, the saints. Something interesting to know right now as we walk in our Christian lives, God does have his eye on you. He is watching you, not out of judgment, but out of affection. He can't keep his eyes off of you. But he's not the only one watching you, gang. Did you know this? The angels are watching you too. The angels are checking you out. The Bible tells us, Paul writes, that the angels are looking at us, trying to figure out what's going on with these humans. Why does God love them so much? What's the deal here with grace? They're looking into these things, they're watching our lives, and they're going, this is something that we've never seen before. In all our time with God, these people, they got free will, and they're running around, they're doing these weird things, and boy, there's some people who really love God, and some people who really hate Him, and He's not doing anything about it. The angels are watching you, and you're every step to figure out what this is all about. So are the witnesses. The great cloud of witnesses, they're watching you. Which means at any given point, at any time in your life, you got a great cloud of witnesses watching. I almost, 
I almost walked in on Barb in the bathroom this morning over the Gilmore's house. How embarrassing was that? And then we had to come up here and lead worship together. But the good thing is, Rod's fault. I go running over there. Here's the rest of me. I, I know. I'm gonna, I'll take this off the tape later. But I was running over there. And the, and the front bathroom was right there. And I jiggled the door. And, and Dan, you know, oh, there's someone in here. Okay. And, and Rod goes, hey, just go upstairs and use my bathroom. Oh, okay. So I go lumbering on upstairs, not knowing, you know. You start to turn the door. And you're, excuse me. Okay, I'm out of here. I'm done. And we laughed on the way back over here. Dang. There's a great cloud of witnesses that's a watching you everywhere you go. We're surrounded by a great cloud. Grandma. Grandma's there. Uncle Ed. All those people who have gone on before. Maureen and I were talking this morning. She was mentioning a friend of hers that had passed away seven years ago. Part of the great cloud of witnesses. These clouds... These clouds, when Jesus comes with the clouds, it's the saints. Jude 14 says it was about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. The word holy ones, some of your Bibles might say saints. It's hagios in the Greek. It is a word never applied to angels, but applied to believers. Saints. And we're told that this early, early prophecy in the seventh generation from Adam, Enoch, did you know? He was a prophet. And Jude tells us this prophet said that the Lord came with the clouds, with many thousands of his saints. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, Paul said, The Lord will establish your hearts without blame in holiness before the, our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Hagias, holy ones. When Jesus returns... He returns with the saints. Great clouds. He comes with the clouds. Clouds of witnesses. Clouds who are saints. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm ready to buy that yet, Rick. That's okay. Because you're going to see it again. And you're going to see it more clearly. And it's exciting stuff. Verse 7, the last part of the verse. says that he comes with the clouds and every eye will see him. Every eye is going to see him. That means that gang, Jesus is coming in real time. Which, by the way, is another distinction between the rapture and the glorious appearing of Jesus as two events in one second coming. The distinction between the rapture and the glorious appearing at the rapture were snatched away. The rapture, the Bible tells us that we're caught up. Two people are working in a field. One is taken, the other is left. Two people are grinding at the mill. One's taken, the other's left. At the rapture, no one's going to even know what's going on. No one's going to see the thief in the night at the rapture. But we're told at his glorious appearing, every eye will see him. How is that possible? How is it possible that in Washington, we will see the Lord at the same time that someone sees him coming with these clouds in the Middle East? How is that possible? Well, it wasn't possible into the advent of satellite and everything else. We're watching the war in Iraq. Any moment you turn on your TV, you're there in real time. Not this is what happened and we're showing you a tape of what we got that we had mailed back across the ocean. No, this is real time. Every eye will see him. And John says, even those who pierced him. Even those who pierced him. Zechariah 12.10 the Lord says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Who specifically does the prophet indicate will feel the weight of the responsibility of Jesus' murder? Jewish people will. I'm not saying that they alone are responsible. Oh no, it was Jews and Gentiles all together that hung Jesus on the cross. Our sin did it. But when the Jewish people see Jesus coming in the clouds, they will look on him who they have pierced and they will mourn over him, the Bible tells us. It's the house of David, the Jews. Matthew 27, 25, and in a self-prophecy, all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. It was the line that was cut out from Mel Gibson's The Passion because it was so incendiary. It was so problematic. Jewish people saying, that's it's just going to cause more anti-Semitism if you say that we're the ones who said our blood, His blood be on us and on our children. But that's what they said. And the thing is, and this is wonderful, isn't that what we want? His blood to be on me and on my children? 
His blood be on us. If His blood is not on us, then we have no hope. But this is great. Zechariah 13, the next chapter over from that prophecy, verse 6, tells us that one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms or literally in your hands? And then he will say, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He still calls them friends. Those who murdered me. I was wounded in the house of my friends. Jesus is still calling them friends. Last verse we'll cover tonight. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. We're going to look more closely at this next week, but this last thing, this is interesting to me. Because the Alpha and the Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. If you know anything about Greek, or maybe you don't know much, but at least you've heard that. Alpha, Omega, first and the last is the A and the Z, if you're comparing it to the English alphabet. Alpha, Omega. But each letter also, or each word also has its own letters in it. The Alpha would be, you know, Alpha, Lambda, Phi, Alpha, spelling out in the Greek, Alpha. And so when you read this, it says, I am the Alpha. The word is spelled out. But when he says, I am the Omega, the word is not spelled out. It's the letter. You wouldn't know this from just looking at the English translation. I'm the Alpha, the full word, and I am the Omega, just the letter. It's like a little upside-down horseshoe. And it might be wise in your Bible just to draw that in. Draw a little upside-down horseshoe right beside Omega. That's all that's there in the Greek. The word Omega is not written out. It doesn't have that. If you were writing it out in the Greek, and I'm just going to say this to impress you, Omicron, Mu, Epsilon, Gamma, Alpha are the letters that would be in it. Omega. That's not how it's written. It's just the letter. Why? Why does he say I'm the Alpha and the Omega? A couple of reasons, and then we're done tonight. I think Jesus is saying the buck stops here. We're not even going to spell this out. I am the end. Period. The omega. I'm it. I am the end point. Revelation 19.10. John says, I fell at his feet to worship him. Speaking of an angel. And the angel said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is about Jesus. Just this morning, talking with, uh, with the three guys after church, we were talking about how amazing and exciting and wonderful it is when you study the Old Testament to look for Jesus. Because when you do that, the whole Old Testament opens up and makes sense like it never has before. Because the point is Jesus. He is the point of prophecy. He is the focal point. He is the beginning, the alpha, but he's the end, the omega. The buck stops with him. It ends there. But he's also saying something else. I am the end without end. The word omega spelled out implies a finished word, but Jesus never ends. He never ends. He's eternal. He's forever. The love, the joy that we will experience with him in eternity is forever. Jesus is the never-ending story, and we will never tire of searching Him, of seeking to know Him. Psalm 145, verse 2 says, Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. He never stops. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is given to Jesus and through Jesus to his slaves to signify the things that would soon take place to John, to the church. Why? To reveal Jesus. I said this last week, I'll say it one more time. Don't you dare, at least in front of me, call this the book of Revelation. Because it's one revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. To get that, you will get this book. Now let me just ask a final question. Who's ready for their glorified body? <laughs> Again, talking to Marine this morning, she said, <laughs> this is great. She said, I love the whole idea about the glorified body, but do I have to take this one? <laughs> like a lot better than mine, I'll tell you that. Falling apart. These bodies, they're just, they're short term, aren't they? They're not made to last. 
That's not why we're in them. These are like used cars. <laughs> now, some may be classics. And you may take a lot of time buffing them and, and, and working on the engines and trying to make them look better. And some of you have done a fine job. The rest of us are just driving around in our little Ford Focus hoping that it won't run out of gas before we get to the next place. <laughs> ready for the glorified body. I am ready. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50, I say this brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But I tell you a mystery we will not all sleep. We will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye which I told Maureen by the way this morning we're not going to go through this process of watching our bodies change going oh well, that's a little better it's a nice looking foot but can we do something about this side over here because it's still hanging we're not going to see that it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye we will immediately before we even have time to think about it be glorified and be in the presence of the Lord in the air flying around I told you doing loop the loops and having a great time it's instantaneous and Paul says at the last trumpet the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And the book of Revelation, again, as we study through, drives us in that direction. And I don't know about you, but that's where I want to go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much once again for your word. Thank you for giving us the uh, longevity tonight to stay with us a while. But Lord, as we hunger and thirst after righteousness and we seek to know you in your word, I just pray again that you will continue to pour out a blessing. Lord, that you will seal us against attack, against things in the spiritual realm. We recognize that as we study the word more, seek the spirit more, that Satan's going to get more and more uncomfortable in this place, on this island, in this area. And so God, we pray for a strengthening. We don't pray that you will, Father, well, I guess we do pray that you'll take us out of the world. But until you take us out of the world, protect us, Lord, from the evil one. And write your words on our hearts and in our minds. And may we walk with our eyes lifted up, knowing that our redemption draws near. In Jesus' name, amen.